So we are delighted to have a couple of women from an organization called Better Days 2020. And so we will turn the time over to Jen and Kristen. dropped her ballot into the box on February 14th in 1870, right here in Utah. She became the first woman in the modern nation to vote. And it was 50 more years before the rest of the American women had that privilege. Um, what happened that day was something that was incredible. And it's a story that has mostly been forgotten. Um, Sarah's story was not a story of her alone. Her story is a story of community. It's a story of women coming together uh, to take part in the civic life of their communities and a story of women working together for Better Days. Um, our initiatives at Better Days 2020 are centered around those, or centered around those activities. We're trying to popularize those stories. This is moving, isn't it? <laughs> our, our goal is to popularize the past, to bring those stories forward and to make a place for those conversations to be happening here today. Um, President Kimball said, women who have a deep appreciation for the past will be concerned about shaping a righteous future. We have educational, we have legislative, we have creative initiatives that we're working on so that in the year 2020, when we celebrate two important anniversaries, the 19th Amendment will be celebrating its 100th anniversary, and then Utah women will be celebrating 150 years since they first voted. And as we celebrate those anniversaries, we're leveraging our connections to the past and we're creating a space and, and making a place where we can talk about what that means to be Utah women today. Do I need this one? Okay, so in 2015, our co-founder Mandy Grant was doing two things regularly. The first was she was hearing some of the bleak statistics about Utah women that concerned her. And the second thing was she was reading a biography of Emmeline Wells by Carolyn, Carol Madsen. And as she read this biography of Emmeline, she was astounded by Emmeline's progressive views. And these quotes that she read um, seem progressive even now, uh, more than 100 years later. And she wondered why, after you know, she had reading these things and, and reading about Emmeline, she had never heard of this remarkable woman before. She had been raised LDS. She had um, lived her adult life in Utah, and then she had had a few children go through the school system, and, and never had she once heard this, this woman mentioned, and she wondered why. And she realized in her study that she, there was this interesting anniversary coming up. It was gonna be the anniversary of the, 20, of the 19th Amendment in the year 2020, and it would also be the 150th anniversary of that first ballot um, in 1870 that Jen referred to before. And she made a commitment to herself that she would not let that anniversary go by without Emmeline Wells becoming a household name in Utah. And so she met with Nyland and they, um, they started the organization Better Days 2020. And the hope was that as people learn about Emmeline and these other early suffragists, that they would be um, inspired um, to maybe live their lives differently or have a different perspective of Utah women. Um, so what was it about this dainty um, woman, Emmeline, that inspired Mandy? She was less than five foot tall, um, not even 100 pounds, um, and she always wore earrings and rings and scarves, um, and was described as exquisitely delicate and dainty. Um, so I want to tell you a few things that inspired Mandy and inspires us about Emmeline. Um, Emmeline was resilient. As a teenager, she was widowed. She lost her very first baby. Um, and by again at age 22, she will be widowed again and left with two young daughters that she's gonna have to provide for by herself. Um, and she's gonna do that through teaching. 
Um, she's eventually going to find some financial security when she marries Daniel Wells back here in Utah. Um, but she's his seventh plural wife, and she's often lonely and sad and misses him, and, and the relationship that she has with him isn't quite what she would hope for or wanted to have. Um, in middle age, she's going to see two additional um, daughters die before she does. Um, and then her pride and joy, her little house in downtown Salt Lake City, she will eventually lose um, because of Daniel's financial woes. And Emmeline is not immune to these troubles, but she's resilient. If you read through her diary, she, these, these things, they trouble her and they're hard for her. She says things like, oh, my heart aches so, tis killing me by inches. But even though she, these things were hard, she never, she never gave up. She kind of just kept putting one foot in front of the other um, and, and kept just doing the best she could. Um, the other thing we're um, inspired by Emmeline is that she aspired to be everything that a god intended to be. She was ambitious. Um, as an older woman, she said, was it under the hemlock bough that I sat on a summer's day with proud ambition burning in my soul, ambition to be great and known to fame, when a gentle whisper came, there is no excellence without labor. And she was willing to put in that labor to be excellent. She, at the age of 49, becomes the editor-in-chief of the Woman's Exponent, which is a um, newspaper that talks about women's suffrage and also the Relief Society. And she's going to be involved in that um, for over 30 years. Um, and she's known there as someone who has excellent memory and, and, and amazing editing skills. Um, she's going to talk about and for women's suffrage and also for polygamy um, in nationally, internationally. Um, and she's going to continue to fight once, once you tell women have the right to vote. It's kind of a complicated story. We voted first in 1870. We lose that right with Edmunds Tucker Act in 1887. And then these women band together and fight to gain that vote back. And Utah women are again um, franchised in 1896. But, she, but you know, the rest of the nation is still fighting. And she continues to fight with, with her sisters for that right. Um, she's also was um, set apart to be the General Relief Society in the Mormon Church when she was 82. And she's going to serve there until she's 93. Um, she also headed um, Brigham Young's grain saving um, program and is going to be able to present our grain as a gift to the nation um, during World, One, World War I to President Wilson. Um, lastly, Emmeline believes in the power of women. And I just want to read you a few of her, of her favorite quotes that we love about what she says about women. She says, I desire to do all in my power to help elevate the condition of my people, especially women. You can also see her famous quote up above her picture as well. Women must be instrumental in bringing about restoration of that equality which existed when the world was created. As women become more conversant in business matters and step out of the kitchen now and then, these evils which exist today may in a great measure be eradicated. And she would talk about her admiration for, for women who stepped out and who opened up the way for the advancements of others. I believe that God's great gift to Emmeline was that she lived long enough to see her sisters in the nation um, receive the right to vote. Um, and she was able to do that just, um, just before she died. Now, Jen is going to introduce you to one of our other heroes of this suffrage movement, who is Martha Hughes Cannon. And you can be impressed by both of these women's ambition, because when, when the opportunity arises for them to run for office, it's going to be for, a, um, for you know, offices within the state, both Emmeline and Martha are going to run for a seat in the Utah State Senate. And Martha is going to beat her muse. She's going to defeat Emmeline. So here's. She also defeated her husband for that seat. And that was one of the most interesting parts of the story. And the reason that it gained national attention, uh, one of the newspaper articles that day, or just around that time, said that they had sent the better man to serve in the Senate. And we laugh about that today, but it would not be funny if it got published now. <laughs> Um, I, I've worked on a couple of campaigns and I can't even, you know, they're, I will admit that they're full of tension and there's some rough times. I can't even imagine what the dinner table conversation would have been like at their house. Or even worse, what it would have been like to climb into bed against your opponent. <laughs> I think that that could be a little challenging. Um, 
We know, though, that Martha was resilient, like Emmeline. When she was 17 years old, she was working at the Women's Exponent as a typesetter. Uh, she had started out as a teacher at the age of 14 and decided that that was not her calling. <laughs> but she was working as a typesetter to pay for her education at the University of Deseret, where she earned a chemistry degree. And she left the University of Deseret, which is now um, the University of Utah, and went on to the University of Michigan, where she earned her medical degree, and then on to the University of Pennsylvania for postgraduate work. Now, while she was doing that other work in Pennsylvania, she also earned a degree in elocution and oratory. So she returns to Utah at the age of 24 to become uh, the resident physician at the Deseret Hospital. She has four degrees. She goes on to get married. She starts having kids. And then she gets involved in the suffrage movement. 1893 finds her with a delegation from Utah headed back to the World's Fair in Chicago, and where they advocated for suffrage and then moved on to Washington, D.C., where they were to where they testified before Congress in support of that. So then, a couple years later, when Utah becomes a state, she runs for that Senate seat. She wins the election and goes on to be an effective and powerful senator. We have today the Utah State Department of Health because of the work that she did, as well as the School for the Deaf and Blind. So she was an amazing woman. So back in the fall of just this last year, when we heard that um, Senator Weiler had a bill to send the statue of, doc of Dr. Martha Hughes Cannon back to National Statuary Hall, we reached out and said, what do you need? What can we do? How can we support this legislation? And started working to make that, to make that happen. Um, the opportunity to place a statue in National Statuary Hall in August of 2020 on the 100th anniversary is a once in a lifetime opportunity, not to be missed. It's an opportunity to shine a light and a spotlight back here in Utah to talk about the critical role that we played here in that original and early women's rights movement. And it's just too good of an opportunity to pass up. But, you know, not everyone saw it that way. <laughs> it passed, it went okay and made it through the Senate, but then we got to a House committee and barely, like, squeaked through. The vote was six to four. And it was the day before it went to the House floor that Charlie reached out and said, We've been reading about this. What do you need? And the response from NWEB was incredible. You called, you wrote letters, you sent texts, and then you showed up that day. So when I got to the Capitol that morning, I knew that I had 32 of the 38 votes that I needed, and I just, I mean, we were, we were working hard that day. <laughs> it was an incredible experience to watch all of these yellow roses start to appear across the House floor. I was pinning, so the yellow rose is, an, is a suffrage symbol, and we can talk about that story another day. Go back, if you wanna find that, I'm like, you can link to it on our website, it's, it's a great story. Um, I'm pinning these yellow roses onto lapels, and one of these representatives comes, and I'm you know, tucking, his, tucking his boutonniere on, and he said, I wasn't gonna vote for this statue, but then my wife called, and my daughter's <laughs> And I watched that happen over and over. While the debate on the floor was going on, I see representatives picking up their phones, and I'm hearing in my back ear that so-and-so just got contacted by their wife. And someone else, after a text from his aunt, changed his vote as well. <laughs> the vote that day was 67 to 3. Thank you. <laughs> my favorite moment from that day was this group of five girls, and Kristen's daughter was one of them. Kristen went into her daughter's school, and these three classes wrote letters to their representative. And they colored them, and they had the cutest yellow roses. They were amazing. And then those girls came up to the Capitol that day to present those letters to their representative. Um, and I want to read you one of these. She said, I may be only 11, but I hope to be the third woman president. And Martha has inspired me to do that. <laughs> what has Martha inspired all of us to do? President Nelson challenged us when he said, step forward, take your rightful and needful place in your home and in your community. He said that as we do that, the Holy Ghost will magnify our influence in unprecedented ways. And then he said, we need your strength, your conversion, your conviction, and your ability to lead, your wisdom and your voices. Emmeline and Martha found their voices. They knew how to lead. They used their wisdom, they used their strength. We stand on their shoulders today, and it's our responsibility to be the shoulders for the people that are, for the, for the women, for the girls, for our children that are coming after us. 
Um, Emily Richards was 17 years old when Eliza R. Snow said to her in a meeting, you know, come up, I, I want you to speak. And she, no, 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 no. And Eliza R. Snow said to her, never mind, but next time, have something to say. <laughs> and we're going to end with an Emily, Emily Richards quote when she does find her voice. Um, and before I go into that, one of the things we really want to emphasize with this campaign where we're trying to bring this story to light and inspire is this, is that there are Emmelines and there are Marthas. And certainly this campaign could not have happened without them. But women would not have gotten the right to vote in Utah if it weren't for the thousands that showed up to march that, and, and signed petitions and circulated those petitions. And that is where the strength came from. And sometimes we are leaders. You know, sometimes we're the Nylans and the Charlies, and sometimes we're the people willing to show up and do the groundwork, and that is unbelievably important. And that's, and that's where we see this connection to MWIC, I think, with Better Days, is that so much good can happen here, because there's women that are willing to show up um, and be recognized, and some not recognized to do some important work. Um, so Emily S. Richards, as soon as this, uh, this bill was passed and women were allowed the right to vote in Utah, um, she, she said this quote, and I just want to highlight part of it. She um, talks about how it's, you know, this is just the, the very beginning of our, of our fight. That which remains to be done opens, us bef opens up before us in an almost endless vista. In a faraway promised land, we behold a perfected state wherein the heart and hand and intelligence of women contribute their full share. Um, and I just want to end with that. We see, you know, we see MWIG, you know, maybe we're part of that perfected state or that faraway promised land, or, and we're going to be willing to work towards, towards that. Um, and I want to echo a quote that Susan Madsen um, also talked about today, but that President Nelson talked, where he asked us to be certain types of women. And I'm hoping that these women inspire us to be, um, like President Nelson said, um, women who make important things happen by our faith, who courageously defend morality and family and teach fearlessly. Um, and I'm hoping that we will be women who know how to call upon the powers of heaven to protect and strengthen children, families, our communities, and our nations. And so we hope that you will um, be willing. What we really need from you that would help us is following us on social media. You can go, go on our website and um, volunteer, sign up for a newsletter, and just help us get this story out to other Utah women. It's a Utah story, and we want um, this to inspire our daughters um, and us to stand up and be all that we can be. Thank you, Jen and Kristen, for sharing those stories of our stalwart Mormon foremothers who have been our inspirations from the very beginning. We're often asked by people, why Mormon women for ethical government? Why not Mormons for ethical government? And we tell them that, first of all, there is a power in sisterhood. We know that, don't we? But also, we have this wonderful legacy on which to draw. Uh, the, the Emmeline Wells and the Martha Cannons and the others. And so we're grateful for them, and we do stand on their shoulders. Um, Kara, it, am I just taking it away from here? <laughs> Do you want me just to continue? Go for it. Go for it, okay. I'm going to trust you know what you're doing. Okay, I'm not really sure I know what I'm doing because I'm a little nervous I have to tell you about this next part. So we wanted to end, we wanted, um, the four founders wanted to be able to leave some closing remarks. And as we've said, one of our founders, Melissa Dalton Bradford, who lives in um, Germany was unable to be here, and so she recorded something, and she wouldn't let any of us see it beforehand. She sent it to you. It's okay. Okay. All right. And I'm sure she has, Melissa. We love you. She's and it's probably the middle of the night for her. Um, so uh, the reason I'm a little nervous is because a few weeks ago, or a couple of months ago, I don't know when it was, I had a crazy dream. And I told Melissa about it, and then I shared it with Linda and Diana as well. And Melissa, um, who actually is a gifted dream interpreter, she is a true daughter of Daniel and Joseph, but um, she said that she was going to interpret the dream. We're not sure if she was kidding, so this may be an interpretation of my crazy dream. I don't know. We'll see. Let's roll the tape. Hello.
Hello, sisters and friends. Thank you for welcoming me into your first annual MWEG conference being held in Utah. I'm coming to you virtually from my bedroom in Germany and have what I hope will be a very important dream I want to share with you. It's not my dream. It's Charlie's dream and my interpretation of that dream, and I'm going to jump right into her words. Here's Charlie writing. I had the craziest dream last night. The night was full of crazy dreams, actually. I was somewhere surrounded by all white, in heaven, in a temple. I was all alone, but there was something I knew I was supposed to be doing, and I didn't know what it was. I felt the weight of the whole world pressing down on me. Then suddenly, you were there, Melissa, with your laptop, pleasantly filling me in on important things that you had learned that had bearing on our mission. I had my laptop too, Charlie writes, but I kept dropping it. Suddenly, there were all these Italians around us and a rooster who smelled really bad. And all these dear little Italian women kept swearing by Saint Paul. They swear about St. Peter in Russia, they confided in me, but here in Italy, it's all about St. Paul. And then I knew for sure we were in the temple, but in the temple laundry, surrounded by cheery, sturdy, salt of the earth type women who were shaking out and folding white sheets with good natured efficiency. One of them approached us, leaned in and whispered with obvious earnestness, don't worry. We love having you here, even if we're all from different political parties. What was that crazy dream that Charlie had? Initially, it was just a dream to gather a handful of women together to commiserate and maybe to write a couple of letters um, about what they consider to be unethical practices in the highest offices of US government. That dream spawned a movement which has become Mormon Women for Ethical Government, a major organization which grew precipitously and could not have done so without the unflagging leadership of Charlie Mullins Glenn. This all happened at a time in her life when she was faced with an almost unprecedented white landscape. Only months before this all broke, <laughs> before MWEG was established, she had sent her youngest of five children off on a mission. She had been released from four and a half years in a major stake calling, and she had turned to Heavenly Father and asked, what shall I do now? Use me. Use me as an instrument. And that sort of question throughout spiritual history is always a preface for major sacred work which is what has happened in Emweg. And Charlie is the first to say that like Nephi, she was led by the spirit, not knowing beforehand the things that she would do. Nevertheless, she went forth. And our relationship has been through laptops, virtually like ours now for almost 30 years. I've been living outside of the United States. And so Charlie and I um, have been communicating by laptop. And um, almost blithely, almost glibly, I was able to lob ideas to, to Charlie from my side of the Atlantic, but it was Charlie who always caught them. It was Charlie who is almost compulsively, chronically, beautifully, compassionately responsible, which is why her greatest fear would be dropping her laptop. If she drops a ball, if she doesn't respond to something, what on earth might happen? And so she kept dropping it also because, as I imagine it, her hands and her arms were so full of so many things. She couldn't possibly hold a laptop on top of it all. Her commitment to her family that lives around her, her involvement in other people's lives, her, her need to hold up every single arm, every single branch of MWEG, that is typical of Charlie. It's a rare and a beautiful and a Christ-like quality that she has. And suddenly, it would seem, randomly, they're all of the Italians, but to me, knowing Charlie, that's no random um, inclusion whatsoever. Charlie's full-time mission was to Milano, to Italy. 
It was her first time living outside of the United States, interacting with people from another culture whom she learned to love and treat as her sisters. Very much like this venture into MWEG, most of us are strangers to one another. Many of us have never met in real life, but for Charlie, that subconscious connection with women who were once foreign, but who are now her dearest sisters, percolates to the surface in this dream that these Italians, these faithful, these hardworking women um, would become her sisters. Now, what might seem like the most ridiculous token in the entire dream, this stinky rooster, well, he has probably the most meaning or some of the most meaning. Let me share with you what I know about roosters. A rooster is in many, many cultures the most sacred animal. The Persians considered the cock the most sacred. The Samaritans worshiped a god whose emblem was a rooster. Some of the sages interpreted the cock crow to mean the voice of the temple officer who summoned all the priests to their duties. A temple officer was sometimes called a rooster. It was one of the temple officer's titles. The Persian Jews put a rooster in the middle of the Star of David, so one of the recognized symbols of Jewish identity is a rooster. One of the early popes declared the rooster the emblem of Christianity, saying that the rooster was the most suitable emblem because it was the emblem of St. Peter. This is why we see weather vanes on the tops of early Christian edifices, because they were a constant reminder of not only the betrayal of, of Peter, the cock crowing three times, but his subsequent vigorous discipleship and then becoming the foundation, the head of the church. He was the one who carried the keys. He was the one in the golden robes. St. Augustine said in every motion of the rooster, there's nothing ungraceful since, of course, another higher reason was guiding everything that it did. In Zoroasterism, the, symbol was, the rooster was a symbol of light and was associated with the battle between good and evil. The Chinese that have uh, different animals in every and all of the 12 segments of the zodiac assign the rooster as the proverbial mascot of these five virtues, marital fidelity, courage, kindness, confidence, and civic responsibility. The Japanese mythology tells us of a brave rooster who enticed a goddess out of her cave, thereby bringing sunlight back into the world. Among the Taoists, they say that roosters are divine messengers, those who believe in animal spiritual gu spirit guides say the rooster teaches you to use your voice for good. Those who are timid find confidence, candor, and gusto when they consider or reflect on this bird. A rooster entering your life means that you have something to accomplish and the time to rise and shine is now. Self-empowerment begins with that very first brave step into the dawning of a new day. So a totem animal heralds a new dawn with hope and mental keenness. When a rooster arches his neck to the heavens, it lets loose a sacred song. Um, in modern Greece, when a foundation of a new building is being laid, it is a custom to kill a rooster and let its blood flow on the foundation stone, which would be a token of best luck and calling down the powers of deities. Now, Charlie grew up on a farm, and so she knows that a rooster, it only takes one rooster to fertilize a whole coop of hens. So much power emanates from that one little fragile, um, brightly colored creature. The fact, Charlie, that that rooster is stinky can only mean that you might need to shower a little more often than you have. Let it be known that Charlie has had to go days without showering, days without eating, has been, has compromised her health, her sleep, and her sanity um, for the sake of this sacred mission, which is MWEG. Now, why do those Italian women then say, in the middle of this dream, they say, here in Italy. So we now have a geographic, geographically specific um, hint. We're now in Italy. We're now in Italy and we're in the laundry of a temple. 
There is a temple being built in Rome right now, as all of us know. And I would suggest that it is, its construction is has been far less streamlined, I would say, than that of the building of Emweg. But this parallel between building this organization and the construction of a temple has profound meaning, meaning for me. Charlie has shared with, with all of us, with many of us, but it bears repeating that one of the first inspirational communications that she had when she was helping to head out Emweg was that Heavenly Father and, and her Heavenly Mother said to her, we are schooling our daughters. And a temple is a place of sacred education. And Emweg follows that pattern. And how does it follow that pattern? Well, the last thing that, that I want to mention is these women, all of us, <laughs> salt of the earth, some of us who consider ourselves unseen, unempowered, unimportant, ill-equipped, unprepared, um, garden variety, we're all working together in this unseen movement beneath the foundation of a great and marvelous sacred work. And we're shaking out white sheets. Where did that take my thoughts? To where it's taking many of your thoughts to, to the great address given by Alma on what scholars say is Yom Kippur, or the Day of the Covering, the Day of Atonement, the Day of the Holy Garment, where Alma in chapter 5 says that we must have our garments washed clean, our robes washed clean. They must be purified until they are cleansed from all stain through the blood of him of whom it has been spoken by our fathers, who should come to redeem his people from their sins. And Alma goes on in four verses and emphasizes how important it is to have these clean garments, these clean, pristine, white robes. What does all of this say about Emweg and about the work that we are doing here? Obviously, it points to the power of sorority, of these sisters working together, regardless of cultural, linguistic, ideological, political boundaries, of being a, a bastion of unity, of being certain that our own holy robes are clean, because only then can we call upon this divine power that is ours. We are robed in power and righteousness. And it is exactly that power when we're true to our covenants and true to the principles that we try to live by here at Emweg that we can call down power on this sacred work. That we are in essence, yes, building a civic engagement organization, yes, but we are also building Zion. We are also building Zion. And all of our voices can be the voice of the rooster. All of our voices can be, can be filled with light and, and power and clarity as we work together and as we follow not just Charlie's leadership, but the leadership of our Savior and our Lord and our atoning Master, Jesus Christ. That and only that will give this organization, the power that it needs to combat darkness, to speak truth, and to move forward to build who knows what. I can't say in my German bedroom today what the future of Mormon Women for Ethical Government is, but I do know something. The fact that it has come to where it has and that it has done so much good is only an indication of what lies ahead for us on this beautiful white landscape ahead. Thank you, sisters, and thank you especially, Charlie, my sister, the sister of my soul, for the leadership that you have given us all and for the goodness that is coming by small, mundane tasks as we raise our voices in unity for good and for ethics. Thank you.
Wow. <laughs> I, I think the first thing I need to do is assure everyone that I showered this morning. <laughs> It is true. You know after you've had a baby, I keep using this analogy, when you have a baby, that first year after you've had the baby, it, you know, 24-7, if you get in the shower, it's a major accomplishment, right? <laughs> Emmawag has been a, like a baby, but like a gigantic, <laughs> a gigantic baby. So yes, I do have to admit, there have been days when I haven't really left my computer long enough to get in the shower for three, four, maybe <laughs> days in a row sometimes. But anyway, Melissa, Melissa, is this the camera? Is it Melissa? I love you. Thank you. We couldn't have done any of this without you. Thank you. And wow, who knew all that about roosters? <laughs> that's pretty, that's pretty incredible. Um, I'm going to share something with you. I hadn't planned to do this, and forgive me because it is of a rather personal nature, but I feel like I want to share this with you. Um, <clears throat> the past couple of weeks have been particularly difficult ones for our family. We've had a couple of very major medical emergencies, uh, one of which required me staying uh, all night in the hospital for several consecutive nights. Um, not sleeping, of course. Uh, for those of you that have tried to sleep in what they call recliners next to the beds in a hospital. Um, a very sick daughter-in-law, in addition with grandbabies that needed to be cared for, and some um, crushing setbacks, and uh, a number of other things, and of course, the work of MWEG is relentless and it goes on and on and on. Just yesterday, we had um, a, a two different, um, a, an attorney contact us again with a case of an egregious unethical deportation that was happening. Um, and then trying to get ready for the conference. And earlier this week, after working until about 2 a.m., I fell into bed utterly exhausted. And I slept a few hours and woke up early, uh, if possible, feeling even more exhausted than I had before. I was completely depleted, and I didn't know if I had the energy to get out of bed. And the, the terrible thing about it was that I couldn't remember what it was all for. I couldn't remember why we were doing all of this. For a year and two months minus two days, no matter how crazy things were, it was always crystal clear to me why we were doing this. But I couldn't remember that morning. And it, it was a terrible feeling. I got out of bed, I fell to my knees, I opened my scriptures and tried to find some comfort there. And then I reached out across the Atlantic to my dear friend, Melissa, and I said, help me. Help me remember, why, why are we doing this? Does it matter? And she shared a number of things with me, but the thing that she said that, bing, turned that light on and illuminated my whole soul with light again was when she said, as she said in this piece, we're building Zion. We're working towards Zion. And it was like, yes. That's what we're doing. That is what we're doing. Apart from the day to day, the here and now, the political issues, the daily disaster out of Washington, DC, all of which is important, all of which is critical. But beyond that, this is a spiritual work. We are working toward Zion. The beloved community, as Dr. King called it. That's what this is all about. And we have to keep going. Sisters, there are going to be times when you're exhausted too. We've all been exhausted at one point or another this past year. And it's OK if we need to step back for a little while and let someone else continue to hold that note while we breathe in this great chorus, this great choir of MWEG. We can hold each other up and give each other breaks. 
but we have to stand back up again and we have to lift our voices and we have to move forward because it's what God wants us to do. We are willing, but we need to also be prepared. We need to be prepared to do what it is that we need to do. This is an incredible moment in history. I keep saying there's this zeitgeist, there's this wonderful stuff is happening and it's exciting and women are leading out, not just in MWEG, but all over, not just our nation, all over the world. Women are leading out in Israel, in Palestine, in every country. It's an exciting time. It's a wonderful time. Okay, we've already gone over, and I want Linda and Diana to have a few minutes to say something, too, so I have only one word left to say. You know what it is. Onward! Onward. Yes, in February, <laughs> uh, I attended a lecture for Black History Month um, up in Portland, Oregon, and the lecture was on Sojourner Truth and Harriet Tubman, two of my heroes, um, two women who were born as slaves who dedicated their whole lives to the cause of abolition and rights for women. And um, these were two women who neither one of them could read or write, they lived in different parts of the country. Um, their contributions were different. There were about 25 year age difference between them. And they actually fundamentally disagreed about one important point. Sojourner Truth was a fan of President Lincoln's and Harriet Tubman was not. And the time that was a pretty significant disagreement. Um, we know that they met only one time and it was arranged through a mutual friend who we believe was Fred Frederick Douglass. Um, but despite the fact that these women couldn't, couldn't correspond, they couldn't write, they couldn't um, correspond at all, after that one meeting, um, Harriet Tubman said that her friend, Sojourner Truth, had persuaded her on President Lincoln. And as I left that meeting last month, I just choked back the tears because I thought, here are these women they didn't know each other, but they were friends. And a few weeks ago, I stayed with one of my dearest friends for five days in Washington, D.C., a dear friend who I'd never met before. <laughs> and that can be said about so many of you. And so thank you. Thank you for the sisterhood. We're, we're united by that common cause, just like these, these women were. Um, we're united by that common cause, by our common faith, by um, our sisterhood. And I love you all, and I'm so grateful to be with you on this journey. Thanks. While Kara and her remarkable team have been busy th these last several weeks organizing this wonderful day and this conference, and, uh, getting everything organized from technology to spiritual nourishment. I have been focusing my attentions more on the manuscript for something which uh, Charlie named before was even an idea in anybody else's mind, the Little Purple Book, which is um, M.Y. Essentials. It involves, uh, it includes the story of our Genesis, which Charlie has told us. It includes, um, the Principles of Peacemaking, and essays uh, dedicated to each of the six principles of peacemaking. It includes um, a visual for the format uh, of leadership and the unusual tree image that, that works well as opposed to a hierarchical top-down. It includes uh, a number of uh, Sabbath devotionals that are uh, especially moving or funny or a mix of both. And as I've been poring over all these words, I'm, I'm specifically today impressed with the principles of peacemaking. And we have uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, we have Mahatma Gandhi, we have our Savior and a number of other people to thank for uh, focusing such crisp and unique words in their own 
crafting of principles of peacemaking, and we have our own MWA variety of them. I encourage you to read them over. I encourage you when the Little Purple Book comes out, which hopefully will be May 1st from uh, by, uh, BCC Press, by Common Consent Press, that you'll look at those and read the essays associated with them and work the principles of peacemaking into your bones and into your hearts and your spirits. And I'm so grateful to be part of this community, my dear sister, stranger friends. I love you all, and I'm so proud to be associated with you. And I too say, onward. <laughs>